Okay, so we again are doing This Is Church, and on this session we're going to be looking at a really awesome subject. We're going to be looking at worship. And again, you know, there's so many different mindsets about what worship is, and and many of us grew up in traditional churches where worship was be still and know that I'm God, and basically you stood up and maybe sang some old songs. But what what is worship supposed to look like in the church, and what is what does the Bible teach? What what does the, what does God want when it comes to worship? And and I think we've got to realize that worship is is really a big deal for God. Um, it is it is probably one of the great one of the ways we express our love and our devotion to Him. There's obviously many others, but in John four verse twenty three, the Bible tells us that a, a time. Okay, so we'll jump down to God is looking for true worshippers who will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is looking for people who worship Him in spirit and worship Him in truth. And so God is actually looking for worship. He, he longs, and, it, and it's actually, a, a, you'll, you will see as we dig into the subject, it's actually a, a beautiful expression of our love for Him and His love for us. And I would remind you that we are made in the image of God. And so a lot of the things we enjoy as human beings are in some ways little, little pictures for us of what God is like and how it is. And the picture between God and, the, and us is really the picture between a husband and a wife, a bride and a groom. And there is this, this union that comes about that is, is beautiful. And God, we'll see as we dig into the subject, God, worship for God is like the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. The challenges we do come from you know, cultural hindrances, hindrances. And certainly in a Western culture, I mean, I remember growing up as a surfer and when I became a Christian, I had long hair. I thought I was super cool. And I remember thinking, I'm not going to do that weird stuff that those Christians are doing because it just looks weird and they look like they're nerds and I'm not going to go there. But I, I had to learn that, um, I had to learn about what God wanted in worship. And I'll share a bit about that later. Some of us are saying, well, I'm unemotional or, you know, those people are, they can go and express it radically, but you know, I, this is where I am. We must remember that when you come to God, He is God. And, and we need to learn how to please Him, not what pleases us. His master, we servant. And so we come to bring Him praise. And if we begin to think about what He's done for us, man, we should really have radical worship and praise because we were all sinners going to hell with no way to save ourselves. There was no one righteous, not even one. We were all going to be destroyed and made for the food bowl, the, 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 the rubbish dump. And yet God loved us. And he came and he, he died on a cross to save us and to draw us, to reconcile us to him. And I mean, it's a funny thing. You'll say people say, well, we're in church and I'm just not really an expressive person. And then you watch them watching rugby or football. And it's like, I remember a few years ago, South Africa was playing rugby against, I can't remember who it was, but it was a, the World Cup finals and Joel Stransky. Which game was that? All Blacks 95. All Blacks 95. And I mean, a whole nation was, uh, a whole nation was watching this thing happen, you know, and, and right at the end, it was like down to the last few moments, the last kick. And I'll never forget, everyone's watching and this guy, Joel Stransky comes and he kicks the ball and we're watching, watching and you see it goes through the poles. And I remember people like diving out of chairs, screaming, ah, grabbing each other, hugging. And this is over, think about it, it's over a, a pigskin ball that's been kicked through a pole. And we rejoicing like that. How much more should not our worship be radical and extravagant? We think of what God has done, the depths he's gone to seek and save what was lost and to reconcile with us with himself. And so really at the end of the day, we, we need to learn to express our adoration and our praise to God because he has done incredible things for us. And the Bible tells us that worship is something that we do not just with our spirits, it's with our bodies, it's with everything. Uh, and so in Luke 10, 27, we told to Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And so there's a sense of one of the ways we love God is not just with, it's not just internally, like inside, I'm really excited. There is a sense that with all of my strength, with all that I am, my body needs to respond to what is going on inside because it honors the King. And, um, and so we told in Romans 12:1. Therefore, brothers, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So we worship God and part of that expression is in our soul, part, but part of it is physical. There is a sense that we worship God physically with our bodies to show what He's like because actually our worship is to show the world and Him how we love Him and who He really is. 
And we've got a lot to celebrate. And again, I would say if you got a little, you know, you always get these little things on your phone, you probably wouldn't take it seriously, but you've just won a car. And it's real. It's not some scam. How do you respond? Well, you just won a million rand or your grand bought the lotto ticket for you in England, whatever it is, and you've just won 10 million pounds. No! <laughs> you know I'm saying? It's like, you're not going to be going, no. There is a sense that you, there's going to be an expression of joy, an expression of what you, and so it is with worship. We, we, and here's what the Bible says about why we worship. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, but as it is, is written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, with all that we think we know now, we have no cooking clue how amazing things are that God's prepared for us. And what I can see already, I'm going, ah! So we have so much to express our adoration and our worship before God. And so again, when people come in and they watch us, there is a sense that there needs to be an appropriate response before the, the king, um, because he's worthy, he's worthy of it. And so one of the challenges is often pride. You know, we worry about what people think. Fear of man is actually called a snare. It's something we should not bow to. And we should live freely, not worrying about what people think, because otherwise we, we're not living free. And if the sun sets you free, once you're free indeed. So we've got to learn how to not worry about what people think and worry about what our lover thinks. And he is the great lover of our souls. He is the one who loves us with an everlasting love. Uh, and so pride is a terrible thing because when you start worrying about what people think, uh, you can sometimes actually not express the things that you should in terms of love for God. And I love in 2 Samuel 6 verse 14, the king of Israel, the most probably the greatest king next to Jesus, the greatest king that Israel has ever had. And David is king and he's bringing the ark of the presence to Jerusalem. And he's wearing a linen ephod, and I won't go into what that is. But, uh, but he danced before the Lord with all of his might. And you've got this picture of the king leading a procession, bringing the presence of God to his people and dancing with all his might before the Lord. This, he's, you know, you'd think king is like, but even the king of Israel is dancing with all of his might before the Lord and in front of all Israel. So much, his dancing is so radical that his, his wife actually gets offended at him. And in 2 Samuel 6 verse 16, she says, um, Michal, daughter of Phil, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing, so now you've got to imagine this, his worship looked like what? Leaping and dancing before the Lord. She despised him in her heart. And it's interesting, she is struck barren because she despised someone who worships God passionately. God takes worship very, very seriously. But the king doesn't care about what people think. He just cares about what God thinks. And Michal actually says to him, you know, everyone's going to look down on you. You're acting like a fool. You're not acting like a king. No one's going to respect you. And David's response is priceless in verse 22. I will become even more undignified than this. And I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. And she said, the slave girls will look down on him. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I'll be held in honor because she said the slave girls would despise him. He says, I don't care. I don't care what people think. All that I care about, I don't care about my own pride. I, I don't care people think I'm undignified. I'll be humiliated in my own eyes because he's my God and he's worthy of my praise. And this is a picture for us of what worship should begin to look like as we come together because we express actually the glory of God and that needs to show in our bodies. So, and again, you know, I know in some churches people arrive after worship. I'm like, do you not even know who God is? We don't want to, you know, people arrive late. No, worship is such a key part of our relationship with God. Uh, David actually speaks about, I'll, I'll offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Now, it's, sometimes it's a sacrifice. Oh, I just feel so brain dead. It's been one of those weeks. I just feel like I'm sitting in the corner and sucking my thumb. But God, you God. And so I come and I give you this. And, and even in some of the Psalms, he even speaks to his body. He's, he, he speaks to himself, you know, wake up, rise up. You know, he's worthy of praise. And in a sense, it's a bit like I remember a friend of mine once, just a beautiful picture. Of, he'd had a really rough day at work and it'd just been one of those weeks for him. And yeah, I remember he, he, he drove home and he said it was one of the worst weeks of his life. And he sat in his car in the garage and I remember thinking as a father, I'm going to walk through those doors in a few moments. I don't know I'm in the garage. 
My little children are waiting there. They don't know what I've been through. They won't understand. But when I walk through those doors, I want to be, I'm going to be totally in them and I want to be energized. And he sat in the garage until he found the strength and he walked in and loved and came in and I was there fully with his children, even though he was felt like the world was collapsing around him. And it's in a sense, it's an expression of love. And so we come to God and we, even when we don't feel like it, he is God, he's worthy of it. And so we give it to him because he's worthy of it. And you'll find as you start to awake my soul, awake and sing, that's David, awake my soul. Like my soul's half dead, awake, wake up. You start to find your soul comes alive as you come into the presence of the King. And honestly, your best moments, preaching can, can show you things of him, but your most intense moments with him are normally, the most life-changing ones are going to be in the presence of God. And often that's in worship. Often it's when you, you see him because somehow worship, the Bible actually says this, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. And I always feel like as we come and we sing and we, we, we actually create a throne, something of the glory and the majesty of God breaks in as his people begin to declare his praise. He responds and we, we actually see his rule and his reign breaking in. And sometimes you'll find in worship deliverance, people start manifesting demons, which we see even in David. The King Saul struggling with demons and King David just playing his instrument and singing to the Lord. The demons leave the king because David somehow ushers in the presence of the Lord by playing an instrument. Don't, under, I can't understand how anyone arrives at the end of worship. It's like, do you not know anything about the ways of the Lord? In his presence is fullness of joy, life. And so, yeah, we, we hunger for his presence. We're people of his presence. If our meetings don't take us into his presence, what are we doing? We need to be a people found in his presence. And when we come together as a church, it's not just to, let's listen to a preacher and go home. No, we come to adore the one who's worthy of our love. And he can adore us and love us back because he's a God who expresses his love over us, even as we do over him. Uh, you know, some people need excitement. No, we all need excitement, actually. <laughs> there is a sense that God has made us to, to respond a certain way. Or well, the old classic English stock, you know, of a cup of tea. Whatever culture we come from, when we get born again, we get born again into his house, into his family. And the old is gone, the new has come. I dance funny. Who cares? I'll be even more dignified than this. I dance funny. I don't care. I'm too old to change. No, if you're that old, just die. <laughs> yeah, just, 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 just. You know, we're supposed to go from one degree of glory to the next. I often say to churches, if I can't teach you to worship God properly in a simple place, like in a church, how will we ever teach you to actually love him and serve him in, in, in the things of life? It's one of the easiest things to do within the community of faith. Some people are like, emotionalism is dangerous. Hang on, we're told to worship God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you think emotion might fit into, I mean, have you ever, is love an emotion? Now we're supposed to have, with everything in us, God has made us emotional beings, and it's fitting. Paul writes to the churches how he, 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 he prays over them with tears and there is a sense of God rejoices and dances over us. We look at that just now. Emotion is a large part of how God's made us and we need to worship God and not allow it, you know, this whole anti-emotional thing to, to infect us. And then another thing is each one to his own. You guys can do that. I'll do it like this. Now, you've forgotten the fact that he's Lord and <laughs> your servant. Uh, and, and the servant does what the master wants. We don't, who cares what I want? He's my king. And I'll never forget coming to a church myself years ago and I mentioned I was a surfer. I thought I was so cool and I had long hair and I mean, I thought I was the bee's knees. And I remember worship started and I still remember this day. I remember looking around me at worship and, and Christians just looked like the nerdiest people on the planet. I mean, I was here because of them, but not because of them. And, and they were all like clapping and in those days, Christians really were, but they were, they used to clap like, hey, David, dirty Joe. <laughs> That's what it looked like to me. It was just, I mean, and I just remember thinking, I'm never, ever in my life going to clap because it's just like, it just looks so like I don't want to look like that. And I'm standing in church one day and we're singing. And I remember the song still, I lift my hands to the coming king. It was an old song. I lift my hands to the coming king. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, great I am. People are open the queue and I'm like, I lift my hand. And the Lord says to me, lift your hands. And I felt his presence come on. And I was like, and yeah, I, I have to say this, I am not, I'm not chicken, eh? I surf big waves. I've done crazy stuff. I've 
paddle level waterfalls that are 20 meters high. So I'm not, I'm not scared. And I promise you, I was so scared. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't believe that I had, I was so scared of what people would think. I thought, I thought if I lift my hands, everyone's going to stop what they're doing. And, <laughs> and I remember struggling with this thing of like, uh, and I felt, I felt the presence of the Lord lift from me. And I knew I was still a young Christian. I remember realizing I've just grieved him. Like I've just hurt him. I've just, she hurt him. And I was like, oh, I remember, Lord, just come again. I, 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 just come again and give me your presence again because I can't do it on my own. Presence came upon me again. Okay, do it. <laughs> and I remember just, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I felt his presence lift and I, I was just like, oh, I'm so sorry, God. Like, I, I know I'm grieving you. I know I'm hurting you right now. This is not responding like you want me to respond. Please, one more time. And he never came again. And I remember just thinking, oh, like I'm learning now about what sin does actually. Sin is just not obeying the Lord. He asked me to do something. And I was like, oh. I remember I, was, I said, God, please. And he didn't come. And I remember getting so desperate for his presence again. So scared of what I'd done and hurting him. That I remember getting on my knees in desperation. And bowing down before him and saying, God, I'm on my knees before you. Please give me your presence again. Don't take your presence from me. And his presence, presence found me on the floor. I remember getting up and something broke in me. And I lifted my hands for the first time. And I, had, I felt like I had won the world. That I had learned, begun to learn how to worship God. And I realized, you know, the Lord is teaching me how to love him. And it's a journey that I'm still on, but it's a journey that I've got to learn what he loves, not what I love. And so I don't care about my own dignity anymore. I want to worship him the way he wants to be worshiped because he's my God. And this is something that for us as believers, we have to learn that we learn the ways of the king and love him as he is. And, and the Bible uses some beautiful words for, for this worship. And, and one of them is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew is yada. It's Old Testament Hebrew and it means, listen to the word, it means to know intimately. It's the exquisite embrace of intimate communion and love. And to see what that word is used is quite interesting because in Genesis 4 verse 1, the Bible says Adam knew Eve, Adam yada Eve. And they, this is an intimate, this is actually their union between a husband and a wife. Adam Love, ye, join, became one with Eve. And so the word she has used in terms of the relationship between a husband and a wife, an intimate union where they literally become one. In Exodus 33, 13, Moses said, uh, he, I uses the word yada when it talks about knowing God. And I'm going to try and think of where he would have used it then. I better find it. You show me now your ways that I may yada you. I want it. I want it. What Adam and Eve had, I want to have with you. I want to die, you God. I want to know you like that. I want to know you intimately. I want to know the exquisite embrace of your love. The root for Yada is actually praise. And it's literally this, 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 this. In fact, it was an, when, in the old, when people used to get married in the old days, some of the old marriage vows used to say this, that with my body, I will worship you. The husband said to his wife, with my body, I will worship you. And that you've actually now started to get this picture of, Yada of intimate union with God, where you become one with him in worship. The New Testament's got another word, it's proskunio. It's used 60 times in the New Testament, and it speaks of an intimate communication and affection that is expressed physically, to bow down and to kiss the hand. And you've got these pictures of Bible words, Greek or Hebrew here, that are starting to express the heart of what worship is. And so... That's the heart of it. But how does it express physically? And again, if, we, if we're going to teach you to obey the Lord in everything, well, then we've got to teach you how to worship Him the way He loves to be worshipped. And so we want to look into some Bible words and see what, how, how does God want worship to look according to the Bible? Because that's how we learn His ways. And so firstly, in Psalm 149 verse 1, we read that in the church we should sing to the Lord. Uh, there is a sense that we sing, and singing is one of the ways we worship. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. And so here we're told to praise the Lord, to sing to the Lord a new song. And actually that new song would actually be a prophetic song. It's something would flow out of our own spirits, that it wouldn't necessarily be a words that we read on a board even, but that we would actually sing songs that are just from our heart to him. And sometimes in our quiet time even, it's just great to sit down and just sing to him, whatever's in your heart, because it's it's expression of communion, this expression of love. But then it also says we do this in the assembly. 
of the saints. In the church, when we gather together, we sing to God. How's this one? Psalm 47 verse 1. Shouting or clapping your hands. Or clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. That means worship would sometimes look like, yeah, like, and a shout of triumph. Joel Stransky's just kicked that ball through the poles. <laughs> yeah! Why? Because of what he's done for us, of the great victory that he's done on the cross. He's defeated our greatest enemy, death itself. Yeah! And so they're shouting before the Lord. And sometimes I would ask you, have you ever shouted before the Lord in church? Because God says, shout to the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people. And so we've got to start realizing, oh, my goodness. And, and, and obviously there's times where in worship, as we begin to see the attributes of God, as we sing about him, Sometimes the revelation by the Spirit will come to the people because it's, remember, it's intimate communion. And so God will begin to show himself to us. And sometimes you'll see him as king, glorious, ruling over the nations. And death is defeated. He's risen from the grave. And then there should come a shout. Yeah, because actually this is intimate communion between us and God. And I love even when Jesus came into Jerusalem in Luke, sorry, in John 12, verse 13, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. We've got people waving palm branches and just worshiping him as he comes into Jerusalem. So shouting, clapping, dancing. One, one, Psalm 149 verse 3. Let them praise his name with the dance. Have you ever danced in the church? I've even seen people actually, we've got this thing, a soki, which is like this long arm kind of, I've even seen people do that in shoot, and it's actually beautiful. It was such a picture of me once of just God dancing with his church as a, a couple in our church. But dancing, we've got the Christian pogo, whatever it is, just like, <laughs> you know, we dance before the Lord. <laughs> and then we use instruments, let them sing, praise him with the timbrel and the harp. So instruments, some people say we don't use instruments in church. Well, can, you can use instruments. You know, God loves it when we worship in the instruments. And so there is a sense that we bring our instruments, we bring our bodies and we dance and we praise the Lord. Bow down, Genesis 24, 26. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord. And he's actually bowing down because he's seen God do an amazing thing. And he bows down before God. God, you, you're so much bigger than I. You, even a king in the old, in one of the principles in, the, in kings of old, you would never have your head higher than theirs. And so often when people come into the presence of the king, they would bow down and she get down low. Now, we come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and there is a bowing down before Him in adoration. Drama. Sometimes we can worship God through drama. Um, Isaiah 20, verse 2 to 3, and this is a pretty out there drama. If you do this in church, it'll be a problem, but this was Old Testament. <laughs> this, at the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take off your sandals of your feet. And He did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall. And he starts to say, you've become a picture of what I actually want to do. So I've even seen people paint. And in paint, they're expressing something of what God, God is using a picture to show his people, this is what I'm doing right now. We've looked at jumping. And again, Acts, Acts 3 verse 8 David, uh, and this is actually David dancing, but now you've got a guy who's healed. And what did he do? Jumped to his feet, began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Sometimes you'll find people just, someone says you're jumping because well, you literally have this thing of jump for joy because it's like, yeah, because of what he's done. Lying down, Leviticus 9 verse 24. And fire came up from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. Now this is, you start to see the holiness of God, the glory of God. And when the people saw it, all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Sometimes in worship, you're just like, oh my goodness. I remember once just seeing in worship, the Holy Spirit just began to show me how small and frail I was, how weak and nothing, that I'm dust. And I saw at that same time how big he was. And I remember just, in fear, lying before him at the greatness of my God and how small and frail I was in that moment, just realizing, you know, we think we're something and then you just see his presence and you're like, oh God. I remember once hearing it preach, David Pawson was preaching once and he was speaking about hell and judgment. And as he was speaking, I started to see the, the holiness of God more and more and more. And at one point, halfway through his preach, I remember sitting there and I remember thinking, I can't stand my seat anymore. I'm just overwhelmed. The darkness of God. 
And I'm risking, I think it's going to be weird. I'm in the front row. I've invited him. There's a few thousand people. There. It's going to be so weird if I just get on. And I was just like, and then as I'm thinking, I, I'm going to do this. I remember Mornay, who was one of our worship leaders, one of our elders, fell on his face. And I fell on my face before God. And I lay there shaking at the holiness of the God that I seen. As I realized how, how I was nothing like him. And yet he was holy and he loved me. And I, I lay there before him. For the rest of that preach, I couldn't move because I bowed before my king. And I love this. You know, some people get weird about this and they say, oh, well, you can love more, but you can't lie on your back. And there's weird doctrines that speak to the church. And one of the stories I love, and, and this is so beautiful, and God is known as I am. When Moses asked God, who are you? That when I go tell Israel about who you are, God said this, tell them I am who I am. So God became known as I am. And when they came to arrest Jesus, they remember they're coming to arrest him as a criminal. They're going to put him on the cross. The Bible tells us, in John 18, verse 6, they come to him, they find him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're going to arrest him to go and kill him. And they, they say, he says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And then he said, I am. I am. And when they heard that, they went backwards and fell to the ground. The people are coming to arrest him. In that moment, there was this little bah of who he was. And even the soldier came to arrest him fell backwards and lay on their backs because of the glory of God that was revealed in the I am moment. Jesus was saying, I am the one who was with Moses. I am the one who made Adam from dust. I am that I am. And in that moment, their eyes and their bodies responded. You can fall on your back. It's fine. Honestly, God doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Kneeling. Philippians 2 verse 9 to 10. Therefore God has highly exalted him. And given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and one day every knee will bow. For us we get the joy of doing it now because we see him as he is. But even atheists on that last day will bow their knee and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Silence. Psalm 46 verse 10. Sometimes in worship you'll find it's just this pregnant silence that comes. Be still and know that I am God. Just silence your thinking. Silence your thoughts. Know that I am God. And the church goes into this place of silence where there's just this pregnancy. No one's moving. No one's speaking. No one's trying to prophesy. It's just be still. Be still. There's different kinds of songs that we sing in Colossians 3.16 tells us that the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. Listen to this, teaching and admonishing one another in songs. So we actually learn about God in songs. How many of you find sometimes as you're worshiping and you'll sing about the cross or something, you actually, it's like the revelation comes, like the Spirit of God takes a song and we're actually teaching one another about God as we sing songs. And there's a couple of songs that he mentions here. The first one is um, in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, three different kinds of songs. And it's interesting, Psalms is a set piece of music. So it's like quoting scripture to music. So a Psalm is when you just start singing portions of scripture and you'll sometimes you'll be singing, you'll say, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, that's a song. And we're singing scripture over one another. Hymns. And funny enough, hymns kind of feels like old school. <laughs> but actually hymns, if you look at it in the Greek, it's actually vibrant, loud praise. It's actually shouting to God. It's, it's celebration. It's praise. And so here, hymns is actually celebration and praise. You are good. You are good. It's, it's a praise. And the other one here is spiritual songs. And these are songs that come from our own spirits that we begin to sing to God from our own spirits or even new songs, sing to the Lord a new song. Sometimes you'll find in worship, the Holy Spirit will give a person a song and they'll come up to the mark and they'll begin to sing out a new song over the Lord. Praising Him, a spiritual song, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So these are all different words you sing. Another one here is singing in tongues. Do you know that we can sing in tongues? And again, it can become the point that it's unhelpful because the unbeliever walks in and goes, what are you guys doing? But there are moments 
where in, in um, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul says, I will pray with the spirit and I'll also pray with my mind, with the understanding. In other words, sometimes when I pray to God, I'll pray in the spirit, speaking in my tongue. My, and then other times I'll pray with my mind, with my understanding. God, you're amazing. I will also sing with the spirit and I'll also sing with my understanding. Sometimes we sing our spirit, spirit to spirit rejoices and worships God. And it's just your spirit singing. Your mind can't understand, but your spirit is declaring the praise of God. Lifting your hands. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. We've got holy hands, we lift them. And this is actually one of the great pictures of surrender. There's a sense of, you know, even if someone runs into your house with a gun, what do you do? I'll give up. And that's really what it is. You're coming for the Lord and saying, God, I just, I yield. I give up, I surrender. You're the king. Praising with instruments. We've looked already, but Psalm 33 verse 2, praise the Lord with a harp. In other words, yeah, we commanded to use instruments. Make melody to him with an instrument of 10 strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shaft of joy. So as musicians play skillfully, they actually can glorify God. And I had a friend, this guy had such an anointing on a guitar. It was the church I was in before I came down here. I remember I would go into his house and um, I remember he had two little kids. They were probably about oh, maybe five and three. And we'd go visit him. And the one day I remember coming to his house and I, he didn't know I was coming because we were the kind of friends I could just pop in. And I arrived at his door and knocked and no, no answer, but the door kind of was open. And I was a good enough friend that I opened the door and I heard music. And I, I followed music through the house because no one had answered the door. And MC and I walked in and I walked into his lounge and he was on his knees with his guitar, just playing his worship on his guitar. And he's three old little kids, this little boy and girl, were lying on their faces. And I walked into the presence of God as this man, his wife was lying in the corner, also lying on her face. And I just walked in as he was playing skillfully before the Lord. Yeah, I love worship, man. Yeah. <laughs> so again, we looked at Yada, which is this intimate you know, Hebrew word for, you know, worshiping and, and, and being intimate with God. But do you know that God actually responds to us? And you'll actually see that in worship sometimes, that as we, like a husband and a wife, sing over one another, so the Bible says God actually also responds when we worship. And so in Zephaniah 3 verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing and there's some beautiful words here in the Hebrew that tell us exactly what God does and this is not God actually in a sense worshiping over us saying you are beautiful you are loving all your ways you've been washed by my blood you are my bride you are my beautiful I love you with an everlasting love and so here you've got this picture of the word is rejoice over you with gladness and the word is two Hebrew words yasus and sima yasus literally means this it means to greatly enjoy and be deeply fond of another. So God actually says and sings over you, I greatly enjoy you and I so love you. Sima, it speaks of joyful happiness, a happiness that affects all the senses. So God begins to respond and he, although he's not bound to flesh like us, but he, body, there's a sense of he responds to us with all of his senses. He will exalt over you. The word is yagil. It speaks to spin around under the influence of violent emotion. God begins to dance and spin around over us with loud singing. The word is rina. It's shouts of joy. The NSB actually says he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So God begins to have shouts of joy over us as he sings of the beautiful one, his bride. And so worship is yada. It's intimate communion between us and God. And so when we build church, we want to build church God's way and we want to become a people who are intimate. God is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. And so as a church, we will not be the kind of churches that will sit back and just, yeah, I'm just comfortable this way because nothing about love is comfortable. It is all about expression. It is all about love. It is all about devotion. And I would encourage you, if you're listening to this, 
Have you danced with all your might before the Lord? Have you shouted before the Lord? Have you rejoiced over Him? And as you begin to learn to express love, you will find the Lord responds. And often you'll find you'll even see different aspects and attributes of Him as He reveals Himself to you as you give yourself to Him. And so I really want to encourage you and all that are watching this, worship is such a central part of who we are as a people. And we need to allow each of our churches across the nations to express worship the Bible way, God's way, and to express this intimate fellowship that we have with the creator of the universe, who's loved us with an everlasting love, who's called us his beloved, and is preparing us for the day that he will return, that we'll be with him forever as his bride, joined together, saved and finally secure in the hands of the one. He's prepared things so beautiful for us that no eye has seen, no mind has conceived, no one has understood the glory that he has because of the love that is in his heart for you and for me. Let's make sure we express this beautifully in our churches. Amen.